New NFL rules see their first action. There's a strange update with the Sunday ticket lawsuit and page backers make sports history again. It's Friday, August 2nd. I'm your host for the week, John Shames, and this is Front Office Sports Today. Paige Beckers leads off our headlines for the second day in a row. After becoming the first college basketball player to be given a custom Nike shoe, Beckers becomes the first college athlete ever to own an equity stake in a sports league. According to The Athletic's Sham Sharania, Beckers is expected to both receive an equity stake and play in Unrivaled, the new off-season women's basketball league founded by WNBA players. The NFL's Sunday ticket class action lawsuit may have to conduct another trial after the presiding judge said that the jury did not follow his instructions. Judge Philip Gutierrez told jurors on June 26 that, quote, damages may not be based on guesswork or speculation, but rather specific damage calculations. The jury found that the NFL was liable for $4.6 billion, which did not conform to expert witness models in the case. There's no timeline for when Judge Gutierrez could call for a new trial. Even after their six-point deduction from group play in light of last week's drone scandal, the Canadian women's soccer team has moved on after winning all three of their opening round contests. Canada is already without head coach Bev Priestman, and Wednesday, FIFA released emails that confirmed Priestman knew about and supported the spying plot as early as March, calling it, quote, the difference between winning and losing. Jonathan Wheatley, the sporting director for Red Bull's F1 team, is leaving to become the team principal at Audi. Wheatley has been with Red Bull since 2006, overseeing sporting operations and contributing to six World Constructors titles and seven World Drivers Championships. Christian Horner expressed his appreciation for Wheatley, noting that his contributions would, quote, forever be a marker in our team history. Jalen Brown is making good on his promise to revive Black Wall Street in Boston. Thursday, it was announced that Brown would be launching Boston Exchange, a nonprofit initiative that aims to generate up to $5 billion of generational wealth for communities of color. The organization will partner with Harvard Business School, where Brown has been a featured speaker in the past. The Boston Globe calls Boston Exchange part incubator, part makerspace with mentoring, coaching, and other resources to help startups succeed. Venue Sports is set to launch this upcoming fall, offering viewers a rolled live sports package that features Disney, Warner Bros. Discovery, and Fox properties. Thursday, the new streamer released its pricing plans, which will begin at $42.99 per month, but that number is expected to increase in the future. Users who sign up with that price plan will have access to the same plan for at least one year. Paige Beckers made history again this week for the second time. Uh, She got a shoe deal the other day. Now she's got a big NIL deal on the way. And joining us to talk about that is FOS reporter Margaret Fleming coming on for the second time this week. So, Margaret, thank you for being so generous with your time and coming back on the pod. I'm very happy to have you here. Thanks for having me again, John. I'm excited to be here. Of course, of course. So let's let's dive into the story um, from from yesterday that came out. So Paige Beckers becomes the first college athlete ever to have uh, an ownership equity in any type of sports league. She gets a piece of the Unrivaled League, which started by Nafisa Collier and and Brianna Stewart, and she's eventually going to play in that league too. But I feel like there's a lot to this story. This is a very unique situation. Can you kind of fill us in from a, a very big picture level of what are the important parts of this? Yeah, absolutely. So like you said, Paige is having a crazy week. Uh, yesterday, there was some news, a little debunking. It's it's not quite a shoe deal. She's getting her own color scheme um, of an existing shoe, um, but still a huge deal, you know, for her to be be getting her own kind of signature thing going on, her own her own kind of look. And then today, it comes out um, at eight thirty this morning from from Shams that she's getting uh, a stake in Unrivaled, which is this new three on three women's basketball league. So she's not going to play in the league until after her college career is over. Um, but it's a really big deal, first ever college athlete to have a stake in the league. Um, and all the players in this first year um, that are joining up are going to get a stake in the league. So that's kind of why. So even though she's not playing in the first year, she's still signing an NIL deal with them. So, um, 
because everybody else says she's getting a stake too. It's really exciting. It's really cool. Uh, for anyone who isn't aware, Unrivaled is this new league, like you said, um, founded by two UConn alums. So it makes sense why they went to Paige uh, for their first deal. Um, and it's kind of to, to complement the WNBA. This is not kind of, I think we see in a lot of other sports, we see leagues that are targeting athletes who don't play in the NFL, um, you know, with like the the UFL, you know, XFL, all of those were kind of targeting other players who weren't in the main league. Um, or it's not kind of like a, a minor league system or anything like that. This is the WNBA players during the off season, and it's meant to kind of be like a another option for them, or it will become another option for them, similar to Athletes Unlimited, where they don't have to go overseas to supplement their income. Um, they could supplement their income right here at home. And so it's going to be based in Miami. It's starting in January and running through March. This will be the first season this season in, in January. Um, and they've announced a couple, you know, a, a handful of big signings already. They got Kelsey Plum in there. They got Jewel Lloyd in there. Um, Arike Ogunbowale is going to be playing. So they got they got a number of pretty big WNBA stars coming in. Um and the big deal is that they're going to be paying them a lot of money. So it's backed by a lot of big names, a lot of big celebrities, a lot of big names in sports, particularly Alex Morgan's venture firm um, is is playing a big role in this. Um, and so they're going to be paying. There's only 30 athletes playing. It's a three on three league. It's, it's you know, six teams. Um, but for the 30 athletes, they're supposed to average uh, the highest salaries in women's sports, which is pretty interesting. Um, they're all going to be paid six figures and then they're all going to get some stake in this league so it's going to range they're definitely going to be like the highest paid will be closer to like five hundred thousand, and the lowest will be somewhere in the 100s but um the the current highest WNBA player is is you know roughly in the 250,000 range so um it's definitely a lot more than that and and again for a small group of the WNBA they're going to be able to have that you know livable salary more money you know be making more um and not have to go to you know, Europe or Asia or Russia or anything like that to kind of, or they could still do that as well, but there's another option for them now too. And they get ownership in the league. So um, yeah, it's cool. It's cool that Paige is involved. Um, she'll, you know, that she'll play with them eventually. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's a cool setup. I'm just like looking at this and I'm like, if, the, if, if Unrivaled can pay, you know, six figure salaries right off the bat, it feels like the WNBA should be able to as well. You know, it almost feels like that like compounds the problem or, or at least like really highlights the lack of, of resources available for WNBA players coming from that league when they can just be almost like undercut by this other league of saying, Hey, yeah, you're going to probably make more money in a summer than you would, or, you know, in the off season than you would during the regular season. That feels backwards to me. It's a really interesting situation. It, it really is. And I think it's fair to, to think of it as, as being backwards that you can make 500000 for this other league for two months, but your main job, you don't make that much. Um, there's a lot going on with the WNBA and why players don't make as much as they do. I mean, their last CBA tripled, doubled or tripled salaries from what they were before, and that didn't kick in until 2020. And so it's like, you know, five years ago, they weren't, you know, 200000 was way beyond comprehension. And then on top of that, there are, you know, other things that they were able to do for the players, like, you know, better. Recently, they got the charter flights. Before the charter flights, like, the last CBA helped them get, you know, like, priority pass access lounge to the lounge, things like that. So, um, you know, more child, better child care. So there were things like that that weren't necessarily reflecting their salaries. But the WNBA is at a bigger scale, obviously, than Unrivaled. It's, you know, outside of just one market. It's out, it's way more than 30 players. Um uh, but I think the biggest part, and I've talked about this on this podcast probably more than listeners want to hear at this point, but um, it's the WNBA is not in charge of its own um, money entirely. The WNBA gets to do what it wants with roughly 40% of its its funds, but another 40% goes to the NBA and 20% goes to outside events investors those are rough numbers like it might be like 42 42 16 something like that but all that to say the WNBA actually keeps less than half of its revenue so even though we're seeing these teams you know exploding and doing better right now even though this media rights deal is going to be big even though the potential new CBA will help a lot the W is still in this structure this this ownership structure of growth um 
but not even growth of like when they were still smaller and they still really, really needed the NBA when they really needed the NBA to go to bat for them for media rights and get on ESPN, things like that. They don't need that as much anymore, but that's a really new era. And so I don't know how that's all going to shake out, but another league comes in and they just have investors and they don't have, you know, this other weird structure and whatnot. They just, the money comes in and they can do what they want with the money. And so it's, it's a little bit of a different structure there where, where if the W didn't have, you know, 60% of its revenue locked up, um, what would those, you know, what would it look like? But it's also like, you know, the W needed the NBA to get to where it was today. It needed those outside investors. In a lot of ways, it still does. Like it still is losing money this year. So it's weird and it's complicated. Um, but as, as we know from the new uh, media rights and likely the new CBA, um, I would, I would say it's, it's, it's fair to assume, I think that, um, WNBA salaries will be higher than these, uh, definitely the the highest paid, um, but a lot of the the not even highest paid salaries will be better than the unrivaled salaries by 2026. So yeah, I mean, we were talking, uh, you know, yesterday with with Colin, um, kind of about the same idea, right, of like, how the WNBA has kind of needed the NBA up until this point, but it might be in their best interest going forward, as there is so much interest right now to to kind of break off eventually, why that could be beneficial. Um, and it definitely sounds like the star power, at least in his assessment, was like a big reason why, right? And, you know, I think Paige Beckers is obviously at the top or towards the top of that conversation. And I wonder too, right, you know, obviously there's the UConn angle, um, but she has the star power in college as much as anyone else. You know, since I've ever watched college basketball, like she is the star. Um, how do you think that her brand coming out of college and obviously, you know, we, we know that she's, she's not going to be in the W quite yet. She's got one more year, but how do you think her brand for a college athlete compares to someone like a Caitlin Clark or, you know, anyone in this most recent rookie class where there's all these eyes on them already. Do you think Paige Beckers is like already a level beyond that coming out? I think the potential for Paige is larger than any of us could have really, it could even comprehend um, from a business perspective specifically. If you think back, Paige should be what Caitlin is. Like Paige was in terms of our national attention. Paige was the player of the year, you know, her freshman year before, you know, anybody knew Caitlin's name. Um, Paige suffered, you know, a, a year out with an ACL injury and as did many of her teammates. And so this kind of superstar team, we think about Caitlin. Of course, she had other big pieces, you know, and Molly Davis and Kate Martin and all these people. But, like, she was really the main star, uh, um, Monica Sinano, whatever. I was a great team. But, like, um, but UConn had a lot of firepower that all went down with ACL injuries. I remember reading a story from about it, and, and Gina Auriemma was, like, even the mascot tore his ACL. Like, the mascot had an injury, too. Like, everybody had a knee injury. And so they have been held back from being the, like – the team that they want to be on the court, but also like the national, like, you know, whatever you want to call it, the media darlings, the buzz, whatever people are going to care about. And so Paige, I think people woke up to a lot of people woke up to Paige this year. I think people who already knew women's basketball or even just knew basketball were aware of Paige. She's had a huge following for years, but she started to get that, um, that like real big celebrity this year, I think. Um, but I think it's going to be completely different uh, next year. She is going to she's going to just explode. I think personally, um, I think her brand is going to be massive. I mean, she's signed with Nike on a multi year deal that will likely or, or could extend um, into her professional career. But she's I mean, she's signed with Gatorade. She's has a bunch of really high profile deals um, already. But I think we could see, um, you know, she wasn't included in some of that like. Um, like the full court press, like documentary, like she wasn't really included in um, all of the media she could have been. And I, I think that's going to change this year, um, whether that's some kind of behind the scenes off the court, like documentary of some kind, some kind of series, like if they did a full court press year two and she was in it, I don't know if it'll be like um, other deals that she's having or just like if she's going to do more like podcast stuff or venture into another I don't know what she's really interested in or what she wants to do but I think that she's going to have like the national celebrity that that 
it has been built already and I think that people are now like really so impressed by her and and so latched onto her um all kinds of people are just a huge fan of her she she really has like a wide-reaching um appeal and so yeah I think it's going to be really evident um I I think a year from now we're going to be talking about Paige in the same exact kind of language and and stardom that we are with with Caitlin maybe not to the exact same like oh, this never happened, you know, This these numbers were so low and now they're so high. I don't think it's going to necessarily be like that, but I think she's going to be bringing in the same kind of audience attention. You know, that's great for brands. It's great for, you know, people interested, you know, eyes on sport, all that stuff. I think she's going to be the star of college basketball for sure. And she's like, she's got a really great, likable personality and she's like very down to earth. And I feel like people really connect with that. So yeah, I'm I'm excited to see it. And by the way, if she does need somewhere to do podcasts, front office sports today, Pagebackers, if you're listening, we'd love to have you on. <laughs> Margaret, we loved having you on. Thank you so much. This has been a very enlightening conversation and couldn't thank you enough. Thank you, John. Appreciate it. The NFL's Hall of Fame game took place last night, marking the unofficial start for the new season. While we didn't get to see Caleb Williams or CJ Stroud suit up for their respective teams, we did get to see the new rules for the upcoming season play out. The NFL made some substantial changes this offseason, taking inspiration from the XFL to completely overhaul its kickoff system in an attempt to foster more returns while keeping the players safe. On the defensive side of the field, the biggest change is the banning of the hip drop tackle. If that still doesn't feel like change enough for you, the NFL's chief information officer hinted on Wednesday that the iconic chain gang who measures for first downs might be on its way out next. The league is using select preseason games to test out Sony's Hawkeye technology, which will measure yards gained and first downs. Tag us on social media to tell us what you think of these new rules. As part of its formal bid to host the 2034 World Cup, Saudi Arabia has revealed plans to build 11 stadiums across the country, including one 350 meters above ground level. This particular arena will be built into the edge of a cliff in Naom, a state-of-the-art, quote-unquote, future city that is yet to be built. Organizers behind the line project said that the site will be one of the, quote, most distinctive and iconic stadiums in the world and will be run entirely on renewable energy generated primarily from wind and solar sources. The future is now for international football. Female athletes continue to break down the barriers of mainstream sports coverage, but some publications are already ahead of that wave. Owen had the chance to sit down with Ellen Hyslop, co-founder of The Gist, a publication dedicated to providing equal coverage for men's and women's sports. That conversation is coming up next. I'm joined now by the co-founder of The Gist, Ellen Hyslop. Welcome, Ellen. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Owen. Great to have you on. So The Gist gives equal coverage to men's and women's sports. Still a novel approach in 2024, but one that's easy enough to understand now if you follow the space. But The Gist was founded in 2017. What was it like making these coverage decisions seven years ago? Oh my gosh, so much different than what it is now, Owen. It feels like we have lived an entire lifetime in seven years when we're looking at the sports media space. My co-founders and I were actually all working in finance and we're in very male-dominated spaces and places and really recognize that sports are such a social currency in our society and have this really amazing way to unite people, but so often women and other underserved sports fans were just left on the outside of that community looking in. And we really felt like that was a shame because of all of the benefits that sports bring to people in their daily life. And also saw an opportunity from a business side of things as well of really thinking about how can we speak about sports in a different way, use different mediums to story tell about sports, give sports a different voice and really target a different market and try to prove that there is a way to have a successful business model that might not be the exact same as what we've seen on the traditional side of things. And that was really our impetus in 2017. At that time, the WNBA is not what it is today. The NWSL is not what it is today. Um, NIL, all of that sort of stuff have completely changed the game for female athletes. And um, it's been really fun to be a part of that growth and hopefully encouraging some of that growth too. I feel like, you know, long ago, seven years ago, 
women's sports initiatives did kind of have this um this social component this like this is a good thing to do for the world now we're shifting more toward you don't have to talk about the social side if you don't want to because the business opportunity is more and more clear and have you felt that just in your own in your own business and your own you know observations of the space yeah, really good question. It's, again, changed so much over the last seven years when we really came up with the idea of the premise for the gist. The numbers at the point were less than 4% of sports media coverage was on female athletes, less than 14% of sports journalists were women. And in general, you know, less than 25% of sports fans were considered to be women. And we really intentionally with our business model said, okay, what if we centered diverse voices and had 100% of our content? And be created by women? What if we changed the numbers and said we're going to have 50 50 coverage on men's and women's sports? And what if we actually targeted women more so than men, casual fans, other underserved fans more than men, and see what we can do? And when we put our business hats back on, we all studied business at school and we did basically a case study on the market and with the gist before we decided to jump in with both feet. And we really saw that there was an opportunity for us to make money. And I think we are a mission driven startup. And when we are able to be successful, it's really proving that this model and women's sports and diverse voices can be successful too. When we first started Owen, it was so interesting, the number of no's that we got from investors essentially saying like, why is this a problem? We don't really understand it. We think that sports coverage is great the way that it is. Fortunately, we were able to be a part of an incubator program with Facebook and then an accelerator program with Techstars, Comcast, NBCU. We were able to leverage some friends and family money and really prove to people like, hey, there's a market here there was growth, there was brand interest. And then when we decided to raise again in 2021, we actually had to turn away money and say, we don't want that big of checks and we don't want that many checks because we had so much of a resume kind of behind us after that, that even just those years between 2017 and 2021, we saw such a huge mindset shift of people thinking about a, the female fan and the power of the female fan, and B, women's sports being a bigger part of that ecosystem. And I think over this last year in particular, when you look at the Taylor Swift effect and when you look at kind of the Caitlin Clark effect at the exact same time, in addition to what we're seeing coming off of the World Cup, coming into the Olympics, coming off of just record back-to-back -back March Madness on both the men's and the women's side, um, it's been really, really fun to see even more people kind of be thinking about how women can just be involved in the sports space more broadly. Yeah. And I feel like that story speaks to a transition I've seen pretty recently where I, I think if you'd asked a lot of people, probably a lot of the investors you were talking to, you know, five-ish years ago, they'd say, well, you know what? The market decides. Like women's sports gets this much coverage because that's how much people are interested in women's sports versus men's sports. Um, not maybe thinking about if you invest in it, if you put, you know, some upfront dollars and attention, uh, in that space, you know, there's a market that can grow very quickly. Um, is that still a, a question, a mindset that you're encountering today? It's still what we see from, I think, other media companies and I think brands a little bit on the whole when we're looking at men's sports in comparison to women's sports. And I think the thing that all of us have to remember is that so many of these women's sports teams and leagues, they're in startup phase. And I think so, you know, FOS can appreciate this. The GIST can appreciate this. We're both startups as much as we've been around for six or seven years now, which is wild for, I'm sure, both of our companies to be thinking about. We are still startups and we are still growing. The NWSL literally launched in 2013. The WNBA, as much as it was 1996, 97, they didn't have the proper resources for years. They're kind of in still scale up mode. And when you compare it to when the NBA launched or when the NHL launched, these men's leagues are decades, if not in some cases like the NHL, a century older than the women's side. And so then when you think about it from a media rights perspective, all of these bigger companies are so used to working off of the impressions generated by 
men's sports. And so then when media buyers are coming in, it's really difficult for them to be thinking about scale because their scale is a little bit convoluted and based off of men's sports in comparison to thinking about the women's sports side of things. And just over this week, Owen, you would have seen that um, Google Pixel actually signed that deal with the WNBA Players Association, the NWSL Players Association, and the U.S. Women's National Team Players Association. And what we've started to see is that there's power in all of these different women's sports entities coming together to level up their impressions and their reach all at the same time and work with one brand together to help get things across the line so that when they are inevitably still compared to the impact of men's sports, you have to not look at it necessarily one for one because the history and the fandom is still growing. It's just not there yet, but it will get there. We just need some time and less of that direct comparison to men's and women's sports. And I think the last thing that I'd say to here, Owen, is that for us at The Gist, again, we're like, we want The Gist to be successful so bad so that we can show that women's sports and the way that we think about the ecosystem with the female fan is successful as well. And we are now a multi-million dollar company with almost at a million subscribers. And I feel like that alone as a story and encouraging for people to say like, oh, wait a minute, we can think about things in a different way, um, which is, again, the the trajectory that we want to be seeing in the industry. Yeah. And I think the the longevity of men's sports compared to women's is it's a huge point and one that sometimes gets overlooked. I mean, I, you know, I have like a deep history with baseball and hockey because my dad was a big baseball and hockey fan growing up and we would watch it together. And like the WNBA didn't exist. The NWSL didn't exist. Um, like women's sports to me was like the Olympics maybe. Um, and so, yeah, there's a new generation where that's going to be a different story. Do you feel like you have a sense of how, women's sports is covered differently like if we remove the the team names the player names will we be able to tell the difference between how a, a men's game a men's league story is covered versus on the women's side so i think that there's two kind of ways to look at it um and for us at the gist we think more so about that underserved kind of sports fan and that female fan. And then there's thinking about the women's sports fan. I think it's important to call out and probably remind your audience too that, you know, 51 to 52% of women's sports fans are men. And so men are watching women's sports, which is amazing. And women are also watching men's sports. About 25% of every um, game watched are women. And depending on the league, when you look at the NFL and NHL in particular this year, we're really starting to see an increase of women tuning into those games. And so when we look at the way that women's sports were covered, it used to, Owen, be totally uh, a lot of physical descriptors, um, a lot of ways where uh, there was that um, dichotomy between the gentler side and the feminine side in comparison to sports being on that more masculine side of things. There was a lot of purposeful commentary on their lives outside of their field of play that you would never get on the men's side. Um, and that's really, really difficult. Right. And I think that those are the places and the spaces where the coverage wasn't the same. The other side too, because the ecosystem is so new, we don't have all of the data and the stats and the, and the stats and the history in the same way that we do on the men's side. And so while we're able to leverage you know, ERA statistics and we're able to leverage sports odds to be able to explain a story while we're able to talk about all this rich history between the Red Sox and the New York Yankees. We don't necessarily have that on the women's side because no one invested in data. And we're still just getting up to that place where we can even sports bet properly on women's teams. And so you don't necessarily get the same statistics behind women's sports as we do on men's sports. I think you can argue, though, when you're speaking to our potentially more of a casual fan or you're speaking to female fans, that's where more of the storytelling comes in, more of the narrative comes in. So what? Why does it matter? Why should I care? Stats aren't necessarily leading the headlines. They're more so supporting why someone should tune in. And there's a lot more care 
especially from Gen Z and millennial of like, who is that person? And we're starting to see that for men's sports and women's sports. And that's why uh, you see, I think the NBA in comparison to uh, a league like the NHL have so much more fandom from that diverse audience because they showcase themselves on social so much more um, in comparison to, you know, some of those other men's leagues. These days, when you say women's sports, you're probably talking about basketball or soccer, you know, like college basketball, WNBA, NWSL, maybe international soccer. In five, 10 years, do you think other, what, what other sports do you see kind of entering into the frame there? Very firmly, the PWHL, they had a remarkable inaugural season. I really don't think that anyone expected them to be as successful as they were in that first season. They were having millions of folks tune in, both in Canada and the US. They were signing partnerships. It felt like week after week after week with Hyundai, with Barbie, with Air Canada, with uh, you know, so many different industries that we hadn't seen really enter the women's sports space before with Elf, the cosmetics company. It was just so amazing to see. They have backing from Billie Jean King and the Mark Walters group. Like that is some, that's a league that's really going to expand. Right now, they only have six teams. They're mostly concentrated in the Northeast and Canada and in the US. But I think that there's this huge opportunity for expansion there. So I would definitely be on the lookout for hockey or ice hockey, depending who you are and where you live. I think the other side too, Owen, is softball. Um, we've been seeing a lot of softball coverage coming out of college for a long while. Um, there's been those upticks in Olympic years when softball is an Olympic sport. Um, obviously, it isn't this year, but I think we have a lot to look forward to in LA 28. But with Athletes Unlimited and everything that they've done with AUX and their short form two week period. And then what they are doing with AU softball, which is their month long tournament. But what's I think the most cool is that they most recently brought on Kim Ang um, from the Miami Marlins. Of course, she had left them a little bit previous to that, but they are going to be having the Athletes Unlimited Softball League. And that's going to be a little bit more of a traditional format. It will be city based, there will be rosters. And we haven't necessarily had a really cemented uh, profitable, hopefully very professional softball league in the U.S. beforehand. And so I think softball will be one of those next ones. And then last, volleyball for sure. We're seeing PVF, League One Volleyball, Athletes Unlimited. I think League One Volleyball in particular has the most um, – Olympians this year that are in their league as well. I think nine out of the 12 on the U S Olympic team come from league one volleyball. Um, so those, those sports are definitely ones to watch. Yeah. Volleyball is kind of my constant pick for like most underrated television sport. Leave it there. Ellen Hislop. Thanks so much for joining us on the show. Thanks so much for having me. That's everything for this week. A special thanks to our producer, Daniel Myrick for stepping up big and a special thanks to all of you for tuning in. This has been front office sports today. We'll talk Monday.